Welcome to the Startup Grind. Just a couple of um, announcements. Um, first of all, again, thanks for showing up. The second thing is to uh, make sure you sign up next month. Uh, Claudia Batten from Broadway will be here. It's uh, Google Front Entrepreneurs. We're sponsored by them. It's their 40 forward event, which is all about women entrepreneurs. And so we want as many people and as many women that you know to show up. We have lots of good, great giveaways um, next month, which can entice you to show up. Uh, but I think it'll be interesting. Claudia is a really dynamic speaker. If you, have, if you haven't heard her before, she's pretty awesome. Um, and then the following month in June, we have um, Ben Pate and Philippina Pate from their co-founders of Zen Planner will be here in June. And in July we have uh, Michael Park from Photo Bucket. So it'll be great. Um, appreciate it so much. Um, there's some information as you came in the door about Startup Grind. So those of you who don't know who we are, um, we're an international group uh, based out in California. It started about six years ago. Uh, there were about, uh, I don't know, six or seven uh, chapters about four years ago. Now we're over 100 plus internationally. Uh, if you haven't gone to the Startup Brain site, I highly recommend you do so. Uh, we're all about um, inspiration, education, and uh, collaboration. So it's really about connecting uh, and giving first and receiving second. So, um, so tonight, I'm excited because uh, we have Mark here, and he's awesome. So um, I'm going to just give a little intro about Mark, and uh, we're going to talk up here for a little bit. And then afterwards, if you have some specific questions, uh, you can ask Mark directly. We'll have some questions afterwards. But if you have some specific things you want to talk to Mark about, he said he was going to stick around for a little bit, and I appreciate it. Office hours until midnight. Office hours <laughs> until midnight, yes, exactly. We'll, we'll be here forever. <laughs> So anyways, uh, Mark's been a senior executive for uh, quite a while and worked at Oracle and IBM there and then also worked at a couple other organizations um, and uh, has kind of been in the entrepreneurial world for, for a while and uh, started Hot Elements about a year and a half ago with some of his partners and it's a great company and they were actually awarded the top startup last year um, in Colorado. So, I got some really cool things going on, and um, I hope to, uh, to get inspired here by some of the stuff that Mark has to talk about this evening. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mark Jean. Good evening, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Take us up to college. All right, okay. Um, 
So anyway, I'm, uh, I'll get some booze from this, but I'm uh, from outside of Boston, so I'm a, uh, a huge uh, Patriots and Red Sox fan. It's, it's kind of like religion out there when you uh, grow up. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. One support. Uh, it's kind of, a, kind of like religion when you grow out there, uh, professional sports, because there's not any strong college sports teams. So uh, it's been a big part of my uh, life. And, uh, Thank you. So anyway, but I grew up, uh, you know, just really kind of blue-collar family. My dad worked at a factory. Um, I, uh, nobody in my family had ever gone to uh, to college, and I think, uh, you know, one of the you know significant events when I was uh, growing up was when I was uh, 16, and my dad, uh, you know, I was screwing around at school, not really kind of uh, applying myself. And my, my dad was encouraging me that I should go to college, and I'm like, well, none of my friends are, or whatever. He said, well, come you know, work in the factory with me this summer. So uh, we worked at a, a factory where you make paper boxes, so like donut boxes, cereal boxes, uh, any kind of box you can think of. Well, uh, I, I can assure you there, there's no more boring job in your life than uh, making paper boxes all day, standing at a smelling machine in a grimy, closed uh, factory. So uh, that was uh, when I really decided that I needed to do something more with my life. and, uh, and uh, hence, it was, uh, you know, it was an opportunity to really uh, start focusing and go to college. I went to school in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, an uh, engineering school called WPI, computer science major, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of my background up to, is that enough? That's good, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So you're in college, and uh, you go to get a job, your first job is with... with um... Yeah, my, well, my first job was while I was going to school, I actually... Uh, started a little contract uh, consulting business, uh, programming business. So there was a lot of uh, mini computers. This is way back in the uh, day, but uh, you remember what mini computers were. But anyway, so it's like a PC in a room. Yeah. But anyway, so I, I started a uh, business with a few other uh, students at uh, college. We were programming and went around and had a great opportunity to uh, just uh, Actually, that's how I put myself through school by uh, doing part-time programming. That was that was better than the factory. Better than the factory. So, from the standpoint of uh, your early entrepreneurial spirit, would you figure was that the start of that? Yeah, that, that really was the uh, you know that was the, that was the start. I mean, I had a couple other things I started up before then, lawnmower businesses and things like that to avoid uh, having to to be inside during the uh, work of, instead of working in that factory, I could mow lawns. So that was a that was a good thing, but. Yeah, really starting that uh, that programming business was really my first taste of running my own thing, uh, getting a group of people together to you know go after and, and uh, you know, kind of pursue something. So and then after that, I ended up uh, you know going into you know computer uh, software development and worked at uh, AT and T and IBM doing that. Okay, so you came out here. I think you told me how many years ago was it? Uh, Twelve years ago. Twelve years ago. So you worked for IBM, you worked for Oracle for a while. You were uh, you kind of coming back and forth between here in Denver and California, I believe. Um, at what point was it that you thought that um, you wanted to kind of branch out of that and actually start something? Yeah, yeah. Other than the one more business. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, it really was. Uh, you know, I, I was a um, uh, executive at Oracle during the uh, during the '90s. And uh, you know things were was, that was the hottest company in the planet just about at that uh, at that time. You're with Oracle right now, right, John? And uh, and yeah, it's grown a lot. I, when I joined Oracle, it was uh, 800 million in revenue, and left and it was about uh, 12 billion, and we doubled every year. But I was uh, I was actually recruited by uh, some of the uh, top execs at Oracle who started a new company called Tenfold, and they asked me to come in and, and be that VP of Sales and essentially. Uh, Started that from about nothing, and we grew it to a hundred million dollars of revenue, and took it public, and it was like, wow, this is this seems pretty easy. I, I want to. <laughs> it was one of those mad, you know, it was that time during the uh, the bubble and things like that, where where things were uh, you're able to grow companies uh, extremely rapidly. But it was a great experience. That's where I got my first taste of work, starting from something from scratch, and it really was like, you know, the the opportunity to set your own strategy to to, to drive that direction to create something from nothing. Uh, it was all of a sudden, you know, just a lot more intriguing to me than, than going back and working for other big companies. And, and so that's where, where I really got that, that startup bug and that entrepreneurial bug. Okay, so you're doing that and um, you started uh, to 
go down that direction. So what were some of the things or people or inspirations or mentors, if you will, um, that helped you do that? And with that, what were some of the kind of obstacles that you identified and some that came out of the literature, like, holy cow, what the heck is that? I have to do with those. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I, I ended up with uh, just a great uh, mentoring group at, uh, at Oracle, you know, a group of people who, you know, got into starting companies, they've ended up in the venture capital world, uh, all sorts of, you know, various stages of business. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think I really learned through that tenfold experience through them. Um, and, and there's some of the, you know, running OpenView Capital now, one of them who was, who was with us there, another one who's, uh, you know, had multiple uh, exits, another just uh, sold his company for $2 billion to uh, Salesforce.com. So those were my inspiration and, and kind of really mentors in terms of teaching me, uh, you know, about how running a, a business and what, what's uh, what, what's important in that when you're, uh, you know, some of the aspects when you're uh, when you're starting up and and uh, I think that um, you know that uh, you know that that firsthand experience of doing it, but doing it as a VP of sales was really where the, it was like, you know, there, there's an opportunity here where I want to try this on my own. Okay, so that learning process of doing it as a, as a CEO, um, there's lots of things to, um, to learn, right? What were some of the biggest things that you learned, right, that either were surprising to you that you dealt with, and how did you deal with some of those surprises? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is my second uh, stint as a startup CEO. So my last company, uh, Channel Insight, still a, a growing concern in, here, in town here. It's about... Uh, uh, 20 million in, uh, in subscription revenue, another SaaS company. So that was my first experience and first time raising venture capital, first time building a team and all the rest of it. And yeah, I made, uh, you know, I, I think I made every mistake in the book as a first time CEO. And, and uh, you know, I've got this long list of things that I call my lessons learned that I've, uh, uh, I keep adding to, hopefully not adding to as, as many as I did before, but unfortunately keep adding to. But, you know, I think the, uh, you know, you know, some of the things that really hit me uh, that, that I learned through the process is, um, you now this, this iterative approach, and I've become a huge believer in that lean startup uh, approach. How many of you guys have read Lean Startup? So, uh, yeah, so most of the room. And, and uh, my first company, it was really before that was in Vogue. And so we started, you know, we raised $21 million, and we started applying capital to things that we weren't sure they would work. And I think my, my biggest, one of my biggest takeaways was to not invest in, um, you know, lots of marketing or lots of sales or, you know, broadening the product until you get something really small that works well, no matter what it is in every function of the business, until you know how to, you know, do one little thing well from a marketing perspective, don't throw more capital at it. Uh, you know, until you can figure out, get one person to sell it and sell it repeatedly and do that well, don't hire a bunch of salespeople. Or you know, and, until you get one piece of the product working, and I'd say that you know that was uh, you know the the most significant le lesson. It's not a it's not a breakthrough now that lean startup has come, but we've been come just uh, you know every function of our business. I think we're we're almost lean to the point that it hurts. We've self-funded our company uh, uh, completely at this point in time. We've grown it to twenty some people uh, doing that, but. Um, yeah, but really trying to take it a step at a time till we really figure it out, and then get and apply more capital to that. At what point do you really do you determine that that's the case? Right? I mean, you said before, like you just mentioned, you're, you, the cloud almost right now. You're, you're you're starting. You're kind of doing with some other folks. We'll talk about yeah. in a minute. Um, at what point do you say, all right, now we need to do or go get more money or whatever that is yeah. from a. a Venture or how are you going to get yeah. more capital? Yeah. Where, at what point do you realize that that's happening? Yeah, so we're in the process of actually uh, raising our first round of outside capital. And, and, and really, the, the trigger points for us have been we, you know, we feel like we've figured some things out. We don't have everything figured out, but we've got a product that works, and we've got you know, uh, you know, a number of companies using that product successfully and happy with it and references for it. So you know, that's the first point, right? Is what you're selling. You know, meeting the need, and are people happy to use it? And you know, helping uh, refer to others in that. Um, yeah. The, the second thing is, is you know, do we have the messaging down a bit? Is that resonating with the marketplace? Are we able to get leads? People find us. I mean, you know, we're we're really uh, encouraged by um, you know some of the you know just these enormous uh, you know you know companies like the uh, you know. 
HPs and Autodesks of the world and others are just finding us through Google search, uh, start trying out our product on our website, and uh, you know, and then they're interested in doing business with us. So we're like, okay, we're onto something there. We validated that, you know, if we build it, you know, we, we can find a way to at least get people to come and, and try it out, right? So that that was another uh, indicator. And uh, you know, I think the the other part is just validating. And you know, I've been talking to uh, since we started the company 18 months ago. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been uh, sharing what we've been doing with investors, um, uh, you know, for that whole 18 month period. And so I've had a, a group of about a half dozen uh, potential investors, haven't asked them for money, but have shared what we're doing. And one of the, the things that I think when we're read, you're ready to raise money is when you can predict what you're going to do, right? We said what we were going to do last year for the amount of revenue, a number of new customers, and things like that, and we did it. And so it's like, okay, you know, now we feel like we can get a predictability to what we're doing, and that's a good time to raise money, right? You know, as well. When, when you can start saying, hey, there's some level of we're knowing, you know, what we're doing and what we're doing is working in that sense. Okay. Uh, you had said a little bit to me the other day about, and maybe you can expand on this a little bit, um, about that measurement, right? You're, you're, you're all about analytics, right? You're yeah. all about measuring things. You're all about, you know, to get to that predictability. Can you talk up to us a little bit about that and then how you get people to understand what that means? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, a good example is, uh, I'll pick on Kenzie over here with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with, with marketing, but, um, you, know, we've, uh, you know, we've got a dashboard of, you know, here's how many unique visitors, come, Kenzie does every month, right? And it's like, how many unique visitors come to the website? How many then uh, register to use our product? How many of those turn into um, actual opportunities? And then how many of those close, right, as a marketing set of metrics, right? So it's early on, we're not doing a ton of marketing, but we're at least following through a funnel of each step of the way and, what, and, and we're also trying to predict. So Kenzie has how many, uh, what percentage we look of those visitors to the website are actually going to register. And is that going up or down? And uh, you know, we had one month where it went down. We introduced our, uh, a new pricing model and we're like, you know, this, and we, we, we looked at it and said everything else was the same, the website, the amount of traffic, but we had an amount of people register to use it go down. Well, okay, there's a problem with our pricing, but we had that data so we could look and say, hey, the market wasn't responding well to that pricing. We can, we should make some changes to that and and, uh, and see what happens, right? So that's a, yeah, that's an example, and we, you know, we do that. Uh, even Gary does that for uh, the uh, the sales. Uh. <laughs> no, Next question. Uh, Next question. <laughs> But you know, we, we, we really look at every function in the business and, and, and look at that predictability because when you can start, uh, development's the same thing. When you can start you know, predicting what you're going to get done in that two week sprint period and actually do it, um, you're starting to function as a team and you're start, starting to function as an operation, right? And then it's like, okay, now, if we, now we know if we throw more money at it, some, some positive things will happen, right? Okay. So you had mentioned earlier, and I want to kind of come kind of take a circle back. Um, first of all, you got the idea, and you know, tell us a little bit about how this idea came up about Jim Cloud and kind of what it is and the broader sense, but how did that come to be? And then, how did you get the right people to be part of Cloud Elements? And what are some of the characteristics that you look for in just building that culture? Yeah. Um, so, you know, got the idea by my previous company, this company called Channel Insight, as I mentioned before. Uh, Channel Insight's the largest aggregator of uh, point of sale and inventory data for companies that sell through distribution channels. Uh, uh, customers include HP, Intel, AMD, uh, Cisco, I mean, a who's who of, uh, of high tech companies. And um, in order to do that business, and collect, we, we were collecting real time sales data from retail and distribution channels worldwide and resellers. In order to do that, we had to connect our application to tons of, of uh, CRM systems and finance and accounting systems in order to get that data out of those, uh, that reseller channel. So and we tried all the solutions that were available in the marketplace and really found that none of them were good fit for <coughs> making your application, we built a SaaS application, making your application cooperate with the cloud services or apps that are used by the customers or partners in this case where we were collecting the data. 
So um, yeah, so we got this. Uh, you know, Vinit, our CTO, uh, kind of you know got this idea as well and started building these reusable integrations to make it easier for developers. He spent so much time doing that, and um, you know, so two of our co-founders had this idea. Um, we sat around and weren't sure exactly how to position it, but developed an initial hypothesis sitting around in, in uh, Starbucks, uh, you know, for <laughs> until this place That's opened. Great. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, until places like this opened, and, you know, Innovation Pavilion and stuff like that, it was, you know, you know, the, the uh, Starbucks and Panera's where, you know, where you have Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, were like the uh, office, right? But, um, but yeah. So anyway, we we just kind of. You know, start saying, "Hey, we think there's something here." We formed a hypothesis that essentially said developers spend too much time, uh, are, are spending too much time integrating cloud services into their applications, and that was kind of our, you know, again going back to that lean startup thing, that hypothesis that we then worked on to, uh, to test. So, building the rest of the team, uh, we were just kind of coming up with the idea, and then. Uh, um, I was uh, uh, helping mentor over at uh, Founders Institute, where uh, Gary. And by the way, that's a, uh, you know just a plug for Founders Institute. I think there's a couple of people here who've uh, graduated through, but uh, you know, really good program for. Uh, I think Gary describes it as it's uh, it's like tech stars for people who have a day job, and you don't have to quit your job, and you can uh, you can go through the uh, the program and get coached and mentored, and you know, great guys like Jim Franklin in town. And, Others just, you know, you know, make a big commitment to it. But anyway, I met Gary through mentoring there and uh, connecting, and so he was the uh, the other founder who, and we really needed a, um, you know, really looked at Gary as a, uh, you know, as this, uh, he's just this uh, amazing uh, community builder and uh, and being able to uh, like guerrilla warfare kind of marketing, and uh, so he uh, you know, joined the team in that. I always say that Gary can go to like a, a conference or a meeting like this, there'll be 50 people here, and he'll end up with 75 business cards, and none of them are duplicates. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so anyway, he's, uh, he's got a basic ability to meet people, network, and really kind of create a buzz. And, and I, I think uh, Gary did a great job of getting us the start of the year award just by creating so much buzz around what we were, uh, what we were doing. So would you consider the, uh, so about the culture of um, Explain to us or give us a, a snapshot of what you thought it was going to be when you first started this, and then give us a progression to where you think it's today and where, where there were, if there were any deviations or anything. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think the, uh, you know, from a culture aspect, um, I, I mean, it, it's a, you know, we want a team that's a, first of all, flexible, right? We wanted everything to be flexible. Flexible in terms of amount of vacation time you can have. Flexible in terms of where you could work, so we don't have like one main office. We we use galvanized. We use innovation pavilion. We let people work out of their homes. We're going to get a, you know, a, we call them pods, but we'll have a pod up in Boulder. We got a team down in Dallas. So you know, we, we, we just didn't want to make it a you know centralized where somebody had to drive you know hours each day or hour or whatever is sitting in traffic. So that yeah, you know, I think that's really a big part of our culture is just you know, you know it's, it's it's this flexibility to to work where you're most productive. Um, to work as, uh, you know, and everybody in the team to be, um, uh, you know, analytically driven, uh, technically driven. I mean, uh, Lou, who just joined us as a as VP of Sales. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I mean, I think he was, uh, you know, go, as we were going through the interviewing process, he's like, geez, another one, another, uh, you know, set of things, but it was, uh, but I found that interviewing for cultural fit, things that we value, things that, uh, you know, we value somebody who thinks analytically, someone who captures data and, and analyzes that, flexible thinkers, um, you know, people who finish things, don't just start things. So really looking for, you know, people who are, you know, have demonstrated ability to finish what they've started and, and get those done. Uh, you know, so we really, as a team, we, we interview for those things. I mean, any, any developer we, we hire has to, you know, on his feet, Solve a problem on the whiteboard and solve multiple problems on the you know the whiteboard of uh, you know writing code you know off the top of his head, um, you know. So I don't I don't think our culture has 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 evolved a whole lot from what we wanted it to be. I think doing it a second go round, we kind of we, we sat down as a team and really had a you know what we felt worked well um, you know with the type of people that we were as uh, as founders and then. You know, we have this, uh, you know, what we call a passionate debate as well, uh, where, uh, you know, so we need people who have a thick skin to the uh, team because, 
you know, we all kind of yell at each other periodically, and uh, uh, yeah, but but to get to the best answer, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I, I guess, you know, passionate people who who aren't afraid to you know voice their opinions, and and uh, the other thing we really you know looked to hire people for were um, yeah people who challenge what we're doing to try and make it better. I remember uh, this, this is a, I think a funny story. So they got startup week going on, and uh, Gary is uh, came up with this idea that you know, hey, we should have sign spinners outside the uh, the convention center as people are going in for uh, startup week, and have sign sign spinners all over town. And, and uh, you know, Christy and Kenzie uh, both said, you know, you know, you kind of voice this thing. You know, they're going down a path, but you know, challenge the idea. They said. You know what? We got a great brand. People really respect us, and we don't think you know sign spinning brand. Is, you know, sign spinners are going to be consistent with that brand, and so they won, right? In terms of their <laughs> belief, but they were, but was awesome oh, yeah. because they were. <laughs> I, and I thought, and now I have to admit, I thought the sign spinning thing was a good idea too. So I was actually, so I can't blame it all on Gary. I was in on the idea, and so it was, you know. But but what I really respected is that they cared enough about our culture. That they challenged that idea that we both thought, hey, we're going to go do, and you know, kept us from doing it. So, you know, just an example. Yeah, that's a good example. I've had a group on time that wanted to have people painted. <laughs> no, same sort of thing. Oh, I'm sure you've had that idea too. No, I'm sure Gary does. Definitely get a veto from Kinsey, I'm sure, on that one too. Um, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, you had mentioned uh, about this relationship with. With venture capitalists for funding folks yep. as a whole, right? How is how do you um, profile what would be a good investor profile on this? What's that look like? Yeah, I, I think, um, and I learned this lesson uh, big time in my uh, my first uh, first first go round. Um, the uh, you know I think the, the the first thing is is You've got to have a partner from that firm who just you really feel lines up with the vision, right? I mean, who really gets it? Uh, you know, trying to get investors in and and you know, force it if they're not just not pa totally passionate about it and totally committed about it, and the partnership doesn't seem fully aligned around it. And I had an investor in my last company where the partner we brought in who was excited about it got uh, left the firm like the day after we closed the round, and then we had the partner from their team who hated our idea as the one they put on it. So I, right from the start, I had this board member who was just, you know, it was just difficult because they weren't all aligned. There was a partnership where there was, you know, the, he kind of went along with it but didn't really believe and passion in it. And so I think making sure that they're really aligned and excited about what you're doing. Uh, the second thing is, is that um, they like your strategy, right? You know, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of dealing with this a little bit right now where we got, you know, some investors, uh, potential investors we talk to are looking for us to, uh, um, you know, go to more to the enterprise. And uh, we really want to, you know, make a model that's really, you know, pay-as-you-go, real simple for companies of all sizes and uh, not build a big enterprise uh, sales team, but uh, really do this more through an inside sales type of model. So if you're not aligned on that model with that potential investor, you know, down the road, they may, you know, acquiesce to that and come in, but, you know, down the road, that could lead to, you know, problems or issues, right, that where you're, you, know, you don't have that alignment. So, you know, I think that's the, you know, most fundamental thing. Um, I also learned last time as well the stage of the fund. And, uh, uh, you know, so if you're at a, uh, you know, getting an investment and you're an early stage company and you're getting an investment from a company that's making the last investment out of their fund, right, at the tail end of their fund, you're going to have a significant amount of pressure to perform much different than the companies that got in at the front end of that fund. So, um, you know, so that really makes a, you know, so, the, you know, factors like that is, because is, again, you're misaligned then, right, that your interests are not, you know, uh, fully aligned and that can lead to, you know, just unhappiness on the board and, you know, you don't need that money then, right? So, yeah. That's a, that's a good point. I'm sorry about that. Um, let's talk about your, your partners. There's three others, right? You tell, me, tell us a little bit about them and about how you built your relationship with them and what are some of the important key components around building that, that partnership team. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, I'd say, you know, obviously there's a tremendous amount of, uh, 
ups and downs as you go through building a company, right? And, and at any any stage, and uh, um, yeah, so being able to deal with conflict together and how that happens, I think, is one of the most fundamental, uh, you know, aspects. And uh, and I, again, I look at for any member of the management team, not just uh, founders, but how they deal with count conflict. And Vanit and I had worked together. Uh, you know, for seven or eight years before, he was my CTO in the in previous company, so I knew how he did it. I knew we could yell at each other and come out with a good answer, and, and uh, you know, and, and again, do that passionate debate kind of thing and that fit. And he wouldn't, you know, you know none of us would hold grudges. We just all want the best answer. I knew how he thought, and and and, and, uh, and then he had worked and known a tool for years. Had, had known you the tool, our other uh, co-founder, for about uh, 20 years. They were actually college buddies. So they had a good relationship, so that kind of greased the skids, and then Gary just kind of snuck in somehow. But no, but we uh, again, what we one of the things we saw in Gary was you know a lot of what we weren't right. So um, you know, I'm not a guy to go show up and you know just start you know meeting, you know, people randomly at an event or things like that, uh, you know, the creativity of what Gary brings to the culture, uh, the, uh, you know, just he, he's brought, you know, he's been, you know, I, I tell Gary part of the time as well, he's part of the culture keeper for the company in, in terms of uh, how, uh, how we operate, making it fun, keeping it, you know, uh, you know, some of us can be a little more serious and, and Gary kind of brings that, you um, you know, lightens things up, right? And uh, and that's important to have a balance, right? Because yeah, if you're all like these, you know, intense maniacal people, and then you know, that that's not good either, right? And so not maniacal. That's a, that wasn't the word. That's an awful choice of word. I had to scratch that from the tape. I didn't, I didn't mean that. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. But you know, I wasn't referring to our company. I was referring just if that was the case of the company. But but you know, if you're all intense people or something like that, and you got like. That, that's everything. Well, you know, you, you need a balance. And so I think we got in, the, in our founders team, uh, you know, we've got some balance between, uh, you know, between that as well as the, you know, as, as well as the leaders that we're, uh, we've added to the team. So, okay. Do you think that came naturally with the team you have? Or do you think that's something that was developed over a period of time? How was that managed? I mean, yeah. you know, Gary, you know, first of all, were you looking for someone like Gary? Well, I, I was, uh, you know, it's funny, I was looking for somebody who could really um, help, uh, I really felt like our way of uh, marketing our solution or whatever, was, it was much more of a grassroots type of thing, you know, get out, get developers aware of what we're doing, get kind of, you know, and, and get them aware if they, and try it out, if they tried it out, they, you know, they would like it. And, and so, yeah, so we were looking for somebody who, you know, had that, you know, capability to uh, to bring that. Now there were a few surprises that came along the, the way, but you know they were uh, you know no, but um, yeah. So I think part of that was on purpose. Part of it, it does you, you do just figure it out over time, right? And you evolve into roles, and and I think that's you know that's part about being a team. What I love about our team is everybody on it. James, who we subsequently brought in as the COO, James Barry. If any of you guys uh, know James, and and uh, Lou, who's just uh, joining the team now, and and our future VP of marketing when we hire that person. Uh, you know, I think, but what, what we're seeing is coalescing. Everybody's willing to fill whatever role is needed, uh, you know, is, is part of what you need to do as a startup as well. So yeah, you don't know what all those gaps are, but I'm finding, you know, James, you know, is, is taking on things that I'm not good at, right? And are, you know, and, and seamlessly moving, you know, in between that. So if you trust each other and you can get to that point, I think that's, a, that's an awesome thing. And when it clicks for us as a team, that's what we're doing is, is kind of seamlessly moving between different, uh, you know, filling different gaps, you know, that, that each of the uh, parties is best at. Okay, giving up some of that, you said, I'm not good at that. How do you recognize first, I'm not good at that? Yeah. And what prompts you to say, I'm not good at yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. And then what process do you personally go through to say, I need to find somebody that can help fill that way? Yeah. So there's a uh, executive coach, uh, Jerry Colonna. I don't know uh, how many of you know Jerry. I see a couple nods. But uh, anyway, one of the things that, that uh, he said at a conference I was at was, uh, you know, one of the most important skills for a CEO or, you know, executives in a company are, are radical self-reflection. And, uh, you know, in, 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 and I think you combine that with accountability as well, accountability to others who can, uh, 
um, you know, mentors or others who, who you can talk openly about in terms of you know, what challenges you're facing, what you can do well, what they perceive doing well. Having good, mem you know, good, you know, when we have a board, we don't have a board yet, but when we do, um, you know, being able to have good open dialogues with the board as well in terms of, you know, what's working or not. But I think that starting with that radical self-reflection, being able to say, hey, you know what, I really gravitate toward doing the strategy stuff and the, and, and, and I, I'm, I, I'd love to set process in place, but I don't like to enforce process on a day-to-day -day basis and, and keep that going. So, so you know, I, I kind of came into this saying, and this is on my lessons learned list, is hire, you know, somebody, an operations person, uh, sooner versus later to take on those roles and, and that type of stuff that I'm not as good at, so I don't have to get distracted. And hence why we brought James in. And, uh, you know, sooner versus later. My last company, I didn't get that good operations person to, to years into it, and, and uh, you know, that was too late in the, uh, in the process. Good. So would you, do you, then that reflection that you do, is that something that you do, or is that something you, let's say I came up to you and I was like, Mark, dude, you're not very good at that. <laughs> um, is that, you seem like you're kind of an open person to that kind of thing. I, um, I, I want that, encourage it. Now, it's not always easy for people to say to the CEO or whatever, right, that you suck at that or whatever, and you're not, you know, you're really screwing this up. And But I really, I mean, that I want from our team. I want that, where, you know, where we're saying, hey, we're not good at this, right, or we're not, you know, we're not doing this, and we should, that, you know, and, and that part of culture, you know, one of the, you know, I think sharing lessons learned, like I've shared my lessons learned list now with my management team. I said, hey, you know, here's here's the things, the 20 things that I learned from the last thing, and, and some of them are personal failure type of stuff, right? And uh, you know, what I'm doing. Example. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, um, not having a fear of failure. And, uh, you know, that as a, as a startup, um, you know, in, in leading a startup, you have to embrace failure almost, not that you're seeking it, but you want to you want to take small again it goes back to that lean startup approach. But take smaller experiments, smaller steps, learn from those, recognize that a lot of what you're going to do is not going to work right, and but that make that okay, right? And that's all right. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to have a process to get to the answers. And so I've uh, you know I've kind of uh, I call myself a recovering perfectionist in that um, you know I've uh, I've got a real strong perfectionism drive, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning, and I, I say to the team now, we're going to iterate our way to perfection. So we're not going to be perfect day one, or our product's not perfect right now, but we're going to iterate in everything we do to, you know, to eventually strive, not lose that striving for perfection, but iterate to get there, right? Yeah. Well, uh, when you, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about VCs, and your honor, you said that the formless relationship and find these folks and we'll talk a little bit about how that process worked for you at this point. I you about that. Second, you keep them up to date. Can you give us a sense of what it is you keep them up to date with, yep. what you think is important, um, what you don't think is important, even though they, you know, how do you how do you frame that for them yep. going forward? Yeah. So um, you know, we really started, um, we started the company uh, September 2012. Uh, I'd say by about March, we really started getting a feel for how we positioned, presented it at VCIR. And at that point, I, I put some milestones in place of what we said we were going to cover and accomplish in uh, 2013. And um, so I started meeting with investors and saying, hey, I'm not asking for money, but here's what we're going to do this year. Here's what our vision is. What do you think about it? First of all, um, yeah, what input do you have? Who do you know in your portfolio company who might need something like this? We've got a lot of leads that way. And, um, and then here's what we're going to do this year. And I'd like to keep you updated periodically on you know, how we're doing against that. And uh, so that worked out great. So I ended up with a handful of firms that you know, really were interested in tracking, uh, you know, tracking what we're you know, doing. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and those things were, you know, what revenue we were going to do, how many, you know, customers we were expecting to get, you know, the, some of that stuff. And some other metrics came up along the way, and we started sharing those and things, you know, what we were trying to drive on. But just making an open dialogue that it wasn't about asking for money. 
And, it, and so I haven't started asking for money now till you know January of this year, really, to start a you know a process where we're saying, hey, we we now have gotten to the point where we feel like we're ready for you know that outside capital, a Series A type of round, to be able to you know invest more in the business. So up to this point, you said you're bootstrapping. There's you know, can you give us a sense of what that feels like personally? Um, you know, each you know everybody's got family and friends and whatever, and how that affects that sphere of influence that you currently have, that close knit group, yep. um, and how you deal with some of those obstacles that that may come in the way. Maybe give us some examples. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh... It's not an easy thing to do. I'm not sure I'd fully recommend it, but I think it's a, uh, um, yeah, the, the values of bootstrapping are, um, it makes you value every dollar that you spend. Um, it uh, really, I think it really has brought the founding team in particular together. I mean, we've all made huge sacrifices and, you know, and that, um, you know, that can wear on you over time, right? That can wear on you, you know, you're not, you know, you're, you're paying everybody else on the team, but not yourselves and things. And I'm not saying that in a negative way, but it's just it, it happens, right? You're you're starting to you know it starts to stress your family relationship a little bit, um, you know, in, in, in terms of when you're not bringing that in, in, income in, right? So you know, I think, but you know, so staying aligned on that vision, right? Of you know that we're building something great. We um, yeah, and our our goal was to you know keep as much ownership of what we were building. Number one. Um, and number two, um, not have those investors, you know, didn't want to have a whole bunch of investors, a smaller group of investors that was manageable, so hence not a bunch of angels. And I'm not saying that's, again, there, there's, there's all sorts of alternatives to, to getting this done, but that was our strategy, is we really wanted to figure things out and uh, stay informed with the investment community, keep them informed, get input, um, and, um, and, and get some goals accomplished before we raise money. Um, and so we set what those goals were, and you know, drove from it. But um, yeah. So anyway, it's it's not an easy process to bootstrap. We've done something creative, though. On the other hand, uh, well, we feel pretty creative. We we use consulting uh, efforts to build our products. So we've gotten clients to essentially uh, uh, pay us to solve problems for them, but also keep IP out of uh, some of the IP out of that. Not everything we built has uh, have we done that way. But I'll tell you what, it really helps you validate that what you're doing is valuable if you've got people willing to pay you to consult to build it for them. And so it was, you know, I think that was a, you know, along the way we were getting a lot of validation, right? It wasn't like we were in a back room 12 months before we released something out into the wild, right? We had, uh, we had those experiences along the way. Did you anticipate that when you got into this? Doing that particular type of activity, consulting to these folks. Yeah, it was it was strategic. Was yeah, it was it was strategic. It was our approach to uh, to doing it. We really wanted to learn the market and the problems from a practitioner perspective, and we also felt like uh, we had an opportunity. Vanit and Atul had done some of it already uh, with, with some firms before we uh, started as Cloud Elements. We really felt we had an opportunity to um, yeah. Um, drive funding consistent with building a product. But the key to doing that is you have to have a product roadmap and a product vision of where you want to get to. Otherwise, you, you can end up in random consulting projects that don't help you toward the path of, uh, of where you're going. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, so tell me, how do you how do you personally handle kind of like one? Second, what are some of the things that you do to kind of keep yourself aligned? Right, maybe it's kind of those two. So, um, yeah, handling conflict uh, may not be, uh, I'm straightforward about it. I just uh, believe in just, uh, you know, being up front, being uh, engaged directly, and uh, I, I, I can't stand passive aggressive behavior. It, it just, nothing triggers me more. And I can't work with people who are passive aggressive from, from that aspect. So, so I, you know, I look for a team that handles conflict head on, deals with it, gets it out there, um, yeah. I screw up sometimes in how I handle conflict. Uh, I try to readily apologize for that when I uh, when I do. And uh, but it's a you know I think again you just got to take those issues right away and can't let it fester. You, you don't want the the worst thing is you know a month goes by and you're you're still kind of beating on the same issue. You're frustrated with somebody in your team or whatever. And, 
and uh, because that conflict uh, wasn't resolved uh, head on. And, and so, yeah, that, that, that's something I really culturally strive for as well as a team that'll, that'll you know, kind of go against each other. I mean, and take it you know, to each other when, uh, when there's an issue. Shout it out, whatever you have to do, talk it out, um, but then get to a plan and we all march to, you know, going forward to that. So, personally, um, what do you do that's enjoyable to you? What do you do that's outside of, assuming <laughs> you get outside of that? Um, what do you do for that? What, what keeps you, what keeps you going? Yeah, uh, some of the things I really like to do, I've, uh, uh, I've got a, a Harley motorcycle that I uh, love to get out and just, when I'm, when I'm stressed out or whatever, uh, taking, a, taking a ride for a few hundred miles through mountain passes and everything else is a, uh, is a great relief, you know, with some friends. And, you know, really, it's one of those things where if you're driving fast and you're going through curves and stuff like that, you've got to be fully concentrated on what you're doing and you've got to be just completely present in the moment. So that's one of the things I like to do to, to get present. I also like biking, uh, cycling. Like skiing, don't get to do that nearly as much as I uh, as I, as I would like to. But uh, you know, anything where I can just you know get just focused and present in the moment, I get some of my best ideas doing some you know, stuff like that, right? Where when when you do get those opportunities. Biggest success today. Well, I I, um, I think the, the you know the, the biggest success with uh, cloud. I'll, I'll talk about specifically with cloud elements is you know I think we've just built a, a just this amazing team we've got a you know uh, about 17 full-time people another five or six con uh, you know uh, contractors that we uh, you know consider family as well are you know part of the team and I just think we've just you know every person in the organization we've you know we've hit on and that's not always going to be the case but we've, uh, we've really done well building that team and I, I just uh, I'm amazed sometimes what our engineers, uh, developers pull off. I'm amazed, you know, and how quickly and, uh, we were up at a major, you know, Fortune 50 company uh, recently, and and they were just grilling us in the security review thing. They had their their uh, their German security guy. Who, the, the only thing he ever he'd give me like he give like a long answer and he'd go, <laughs> and, you know, you go to back on, you know, something else. And, yeah, and then there was one time he said good, and it was very like dry, like good. And uh, like, I, and I'm like I texting somebody, I'm like, I don't think his good means it was good. I'm not sure. So anyway, but we went through that, and he was he texted to uh, one of the guys who, were, who who was with this company as well. He texted to him and said these guys are good. And he was referring to our engineer. So you know, we're just like, wow, this is a world class security guy, and he's like, you know. Uh, you know, who has shows no emotion, and the guy, you know, the, the other guy from his team at the end said, you know, Mike never says anything good about anybody. So if he, you know, if he said that, then you guys are, so anyway, just proud of the, yeah, proud of that team we built, because everything's about the team, about having good people, having good product, and, and uh, you know, good people who are learning and growing, and, and uh, you know, I love to see Kenzie, uh, you know, what we, we hired her as a, you know, as an intern, and right out of DU in her first year, and, and uh, just you know, I'm just amazed sometimes at the uh, stuff you uh, you pull together and do. And uh, right here, yeah, <laughs> our website, <laughs> yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's just uh, that's I think our, our biggest accomplishment. Awesome. Um, quickly, biggest failure at this point, or however you want to answer <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Of that, of that twenty some things that you have on that list. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which you think is the the biggest one? If there is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think at my last company, um, it, well, I should say I think, I know this was my biggest failure, which was broadening the product too soon. So we were chasing, um, I learned it, learned it really, uh, you know, of Harleys, there you go. Um, so I learned my, uh, my biggest lesson is about chasing competition. And uh, we had, there were two small firms, us and another firm, about the same size. And uh, we went down a path with, with two customers that we closed that we didn't have the functionality for and we had to build this and kind of catch up and everything. And it took our product in a totally different direction than we should have gone. We beat that other company doing it, but we paid a price for it for you know, two years later of just these miserable relationships with this company. And, you know, just, and I learned that, every, first of all, every customer is not a good customer and that 
you've got to have the conviction about what you're doing and how you're attacking your market. And competitors inform you, but you don't chase them. And uh, you know, I really look at what we're doing as a company right now. There's some really big companies in this space, and they're all going after the big enterprise, and they're all making their their, their products more and more complex. And now I look at it and say, because we know we want to be the simplest solution to solve this problem, that, that we're going to be the simplest integration as a service platform out there. That's our fundamental belief. And so that frees us up to now look and say, hey, when they add that new feature, that's actually a good thing because they're making their product more complex. We don't have to chase that feature. We're going to stay with what we're doing and keep it you know, keep after it. Is it simple? Is it easy to use? If it makes it more complex, we're not going to do it. And so that's the, you know, I think that's that biggest failure, and I, I'd say the biggest lesson learned was, uh, yeah, was in that area. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, we have a time for just a couple questions. So, um, any questions out there that people have? Yes. sure people know your company and what it's about and your introducers. No, seriously, I think that's awesome because, yeah, you got that opportunity. I, I think that's, I really respect that. So, um, anyway, the, um, you know, I, I really, and again, I'm not, not like um, this marketing guru or anything, but I really believe this bought, not sold model that's emerging. Companies like, you know, SendGrid has done this, Zendesk, you know, if you're familiar with that, but that, that where marketing becomes a function seamlessly integrated really with the product in the sales function that marketing is about um, you know generating that 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 inbound opportunities but also but through content through um, um, so maybe this is a little different than the sale but I think there's sales from the aspect that you can close a deal from marketing somebody will decide on your website go to your website can try out your product for free use it, that's all marketing, right? Before somebody from sales even called them, they've made the decision whether they like this product or not. So being able to, you know, through digital means, be able to have your, um, the, the impression about your product be out there through social media and other things, the website, your, and then how it, the product is presented through online, uh, you know, I think that's the, you know, the really is that future where you know, I would kind of combine marketing with product and sales in that respect. That uh, you've made the decision by the time you've, uh, you know, some salespersons even call you. You've, you're, you're just about, you know, you're just about there. Yes, sir. No. You want to come over here? I'll hear this. I can speak loudly. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll how, it. how do you decide to tell Gary that the really profitable deal he's been working on isn't aligned with the business? Um, that you have in mind and that he should walk away from. Yeah. How do you decide that? Yeah, no, that's a, uh, that, that's a great question because um, that's actually one of the things that we put in place is that, especially when we were doing this consulting related stuff, um, that, that we set a set of criteria that as the, uh, the leadership team, we had to unanimously agree that we were going to pursue a project or we wouldn't do it. And we walked away to, from some stuff that Gary brought forward, but we do that early in the process. So you want to try and catch it early as opposed to, and have a process where, you know, if it's something outside our norm, you know, you have a deal review, you review, you look at it, and you say, hey, you know, this should be a go or no go. And uh, we walked away from a number of things. Uh, and, and product opportunities as well, because there's always opportunities to extend our product where, where uh, it's not a fit. And, uh, and, and I'll tell you, now after my previous experience with Channel Insight where I did it wrong, some of the best things I feel about or what I feel good about are when we make that decision as a team to walk away from something as opposed to pursue the dollar. Because it's not aligned. Yeah. One more question. Yes. Um, 
Mark, uh, you talked about how you use an agile process for development, and uh, I guess first of all, just want to make sure everybody understands what the agile process is, and I think that's that's key for uh, basically biting out things in small chunks. Have you used that process with other parts of the business as well, not just development, but just as you build a business and yep. uh, for marketing and sales strategies, that type of thing? Yeah, we use the, uh, ad first of all, the agile process is um, uh, essentially breaking down uh, de development into or projects into bite-sized chunks that you can accomplish in a sprint, which can be a week long or two weeks long or whatever is best for your business, your, your, your uh, type of opportunity. So these uh, uh, sprints are, and you only do work, you, you, you assign work to that sprint that you can get done in that sprint period of time. So if you're building a product, you, you break down the features that you have to be able to complete them, test them by the end of that period. Otherwise, it's too big and you need to break it down to something else. So um, we actually run daily scrums for, uh, for sales. We, have a, a, we do a weekly sprint process for sales, so what we're gonna set for this week and what we're gonna do. Uh, we have a similar process where we uh, manage for uh, really everything in the company, uh, marketing as well, what we're gonna get done this week. And, you know, we, we use a, uh, for non, um, we use Pivotal Tracker for uh, the Agile development, which is a really nice, easy to use tool. And then for the business functions for Agile management, or it's really more Kanban management, kind of pick off the top of the list, we use Trello boards, if anybody, I don't know if anybody here has used those, but really recommend that for uh, uh, the non-technical functions of the business. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Well, I really appreciate you showing up tonight and give us your um, insight, and Gary and Mackenzie and all the other folks that caught on this, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Galvanize, for having us here, and uh, appreciate your Thank you so much. So uh, we're here for a little while longer. Um, uh, Mark's going to be here, and some of the other folks will be here. Until midnight. Uh, <laughs> Gary's going to be here if you haven't yet. Gary, your car, get it from now. Let's do that. Um, I just want to mention uh, again uh, next month, um, 40 Forward, Women from Entrepreneurs will be here on the 14th uh, with Audio. So please uh, tell as many people as you can. Go to our Facebook page, go to whatever, and like us and all that kind of business. Um, and also, again, the next couple weeks or a couple months afterwards, we have folks from Zen Planner, uh, Filipina, and uh, Ben Pate. And then we have Mike Clark in July. And more to come uh, in months ahead. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good time.